how far I can throw. Oh no! <laughs> Without further ado, I would like to introduce Lauren. Um, she will be speaking. Make sure our audiovisual guys are ready. You guys all good to go back there? Okay. So I'd like to introduce Lauren. Um, her talk is called Flailing is Learning, my first year as a malware analyst. So here's Lauren. Thanks, guys. Hope you're enjoying ShmooCon as much as I am. Hey, here's a student. Who here is in the first year or two of their career? All right, the rest of you, your mentors. This is applicable to all of you. This book got me my job. I read it and I highlighted it and I worked at its labs, which required that I dig up an XP ISO, which is not a trivial thing to do legally anymore. Got my hands on an XP ISO, I built a malware sandbox, I did its labs. It was in the carry-on flight out for my interviews. I fell asleep reading it before my interviews. And what I learned from it, it served me very well. So well, in fact, that if rumors were to be believed that the senior malware analyst on my team threatened to throw a skunk on the team lead's lawn if he didn't hire me. I thought this book taught me how to do malware analysis. Um, turns out I was wrong. See, after I started my job, it didn't take me very long to realize that I had only a very small clue what I was doing. Even worse, the internet didn't seem to have much of a clue either. I searched and I searched and I read and I read and I bought more books thinking that that would solve the problem and still I found no answers. And so today, this isn't gonna be a typical ShmooCon talk. I'm not introducing you to a new tool and I'm not an expert. It's gonna be a story. And it's a story that I hope will help some of you out there, some of you new careers, some of you students, or some of you professionals who are in the position to mentor. And it's a story of adapting to this world where I had no answers. So who are you? Now that I've introduced my talk and I hopefully have your attention, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Lauren Pierce. I studied computer science and international affairs and a heck of a lot more. Uh, I have difficulty focusing on any one area of study. Um, I consider myself academically ADD. In fact, if you look at my transcript, it looks like I had no clue what I wanted to study. Not year one, not year two, not year three, and somehow or another I got a degree year four, but not sure how. It's equal parts computer science, criminology, psychology, history, and language classes. See that spring 2013? I even took Russian fairy tales. I was looking for something that could hold my attention. I, I'm equally ADD in, in my interests. So I enjoy hiking, I promise this is relevant, hang in here. I enjoy running, or enjoy might be an exaggeration, but I run. Uh, I like to quilt, and I consider that a healthy outlet for my OCD tendencies. Uh, I cook, and that has the added benefit of uh, bribery for my team. Uh, but, and I also train dogs. I trained a uh, search and rescue tracking dog to certification. Um, moral of the story is I'm pretty much all over the place. But despite this habitual lack of focus, one thing has held my attention for the past three, four years, and that's malware. And I hope the reason for that will become clear as we continue with this presentation. So at the end of my extremely diverse four years of undergraduate education, one of my professors pitched scholarship for service to me. And so I'm sure some of you have some opinions about the scholarship, and, and we can talk about those later. Um, but for me, it was a valuable experience. So for those of you who don't know what it is, um, I think of it as a civilian version of ROTC. The government paid for my education, um, paid me to go to school, and in exchange I worked for the government for a few years after I graduate. I was planning on graduating with my undergrad and going into the job, going into the job market. I had offers already. I was not planning on going to grad school. But SFS made me go to grad school, and I, I, I'm thankful for that, because it was in grad school that I was finally able to focus. Once I was allowed to dig deeper into specific topics, I found them much more appealing and enjoyable, and much more, I was, they were able to keep my attention. So towards the end of grad school, I started focusing on malware analysis. Last semester of grad school, that's when you start looking for jobs, right? I was interviewing, um, and one of the places I interviewed was Los Alamos National Labs. Uh, I interviewed with their computer security incident response team. 
Uh, one of those other random things I did in college, I was an EMT for a while, so I was working in emergency medical response. And the pace and pressure of that I found enjoyable, and so I hope that incident response would appeal to me in the same way. Uh, there was also a malware analyst out at Los Alamos that I wanted to learn from. I'd heard of him from friends in the field, and I thought it would be a perfect mentor. Um, working on an incident response team, there isn't always an incident to respond to. Uh, and, and my team is very flexible in what we work on. And so when I'm not actively responding to an incident, uh, I can do pretty much what I want, provided that it contributes to the hunting and incident response process, which is pretty much what I want. That means that I spend my extra time shredding apart malware. So here I am. I'm less than two years out of school. Uh, I don't consider myself an expert in much of anything, but I do have a message that I want to share. And it's particularly for those of you who are new to the field or who are still in school or those of you in a position to mentor others. And I guess some other people thought that this was an important story and an important message because here I am standing on a stage at ShmooCon. Let's go ahead and get started. The previous generation of cybersecurity professionals, they taught themselves. I wish I was one of them, but I'm not. I learned from college classes and from professors and from books and from tutorials online. That means I'm coming from a fundamentally different place than many of those that I'm learning from. I took classes like uh, Introduction to Reverse Engineering and Offensive Computer Security and classes that just simply didn't exist even five years ago. I didn't, my mentors, they, they got into reverse engineering because they wanted to reverse some DRM or they wanted to hack a game. And, and that's not the angle that I came at this from. And so this field is just documented enough, right, that colleges, they feel like they can offer degrees. And, but the field itself, once you enter it, is still very much that old teach yourself kind of a field. And so you see every, every college that you know, is, is of some size is offering a degree in cybersecurity nowadays. And they, they graduate people feeling like they're ready to enter the field and they're cybersecurity experts. But really, until you've done it, you're not there. Um, so in school, I was taught principles. And then I demonstrated my knowledge of those principles by doing assignments. And then when I got stuck on those assignments, I Googled. And then Stack Overflow would give me a path forward. Right? <laughs> and, and sure, there were certainly times that I struggled. I'm not saying that it was all a cakewalk. I and mean, there's seg faults you can't find. But ultimately, there are limited causes to that, right? You're writing memory that you shouldn't be writing. And so there was always a path forward. And, and I don't want you to think that this is just a story of sink or swim, right? Because I've been in other situations that were. I had an internship, and it was three months, and in the first day I was handed a couple gigs of data and told that my job was to pull features and outcomes from the data and train a classifier using supervised machine learning. I hadn't heard of supervised machine learning. But I did it, because there's books, there's, there's resources out there to teach you how to do this stuff. And that's sink or swim, but that's sink or swim when there are resources to support you. In the exploit development, malware analysis, these types of fields, there still are not those resources that give you the path forward to get to the outcome that you need. So this transition from this environment where I had answers or I had a path forward to find answers to the job of reverse engineering advanced malware samples, that's the story, that's the topic of this talk. So my first few months at Los Alamos were pretty rough. I came into a team that was mid-combustion. Teams fall apart. It happens. I just happened to start as my team was falling apart. Uh, I had my team lead was gone within a week of being there. And that mentor that I had followed across the country to Los Alamos, he left pretty quickly, too. I had no clearance yet, so I was physically isolated from the team in a building about a half a mile down the street. This may have been a blessing to come in when the team was in this state, but and, and I think it was. but. It did have the effect of leaving me feeling isolated from the team. And so these first few months, I didn't have much guidance, but I read old tickets, and I was trying to understand how daily operations worked based on reading histories, history, essentially. Uh, I also wrote a history of Los Alamos National Lab's interaction with one particular actor of interest. Um, and that was really neat to see the long-term evolution of how this uh, game of, of computer security had worked. Uh, I developed course materials to uh, teach malware analysis at a DOE event, um, and that gave me more time to spend on my fundamentals. So 
Um, learning something is one thing, teaching it is a completely different beast. But mostly I drifted. Uh, I was doing work and I was learning, but I was not analyzing malware. I was not being a malware analyst. About two to three months in, uh, one of my teammates suggested that I take a look at a malware ticket, and he assigned it to me, and I was all excited. Now I get to be a malware analyst, right? So I opened the ticket. And the first thing I noticed was that there were 68 hashes. Six times 10 plus eight. Nothing in practical malware analysis prepared me to analyze 68 samples of malware. Google, will Google save me? How to analyze malware family? Mm. How to analyze multiple malware samples? How to analyze, no. There was nothing out there. There's no established procedure to handle this volume of malware. I had a minor freak out, right? Who's had one of those minor freak outs? Yeah, no, all alone? Okay, I guess, I guess it's just me. I pulled it together though, and I, uh, I decided you gotta start somewhere. What better place to start than the very beginning? Sample 00A8, first one staring at me in that directory. Dropped it in a VM, opened it up, gave it an extension, did some basic malware analysis, some basic static stuff, ran strings. They were all encoded, no big surprise there, but still a little bit of a letdown. Uh, I, you know, looked at the section headers, all the other basic stuff. I tried to run it in our vendor sandbox and it told me to go to hell. Um, <laughs> So I tried running it in my own sandbox with a few modifications and a little prodding, and I, I did get it to run. So there was a little small victory right there. Dynamic analysis for the win. And then I, you know, I had some notes of some things that I noticed in dynamic analysis that I wanted to look into further. So I opened it in IDA. And that was when things fell apart. Just looking at one sample, never mind the other 67, I was completely and utterly lost. This wasn't a sample from practical malware analysis that was written to teach me a specific topic that had nice little questions, you know, that would guide me through the sample. And then if I got stuck, nice little back of the book with full write-ups, no. And sure, I'd analyze samples that weren't from practical malware analysis, but it was one sample. And, and one sample at a time, right? And they weren't APTs. They were, they were random old pieces of crimeware. I, I, was stumbling through features that I wouldn't recognize until months later. And so I started debugging in it, in, you know, F5, F5, F5. And, and I was stepping through anti-analysis techniques that I didn't even recognize as I was stepping through them. And so I'd randomly lose control of the debugger and be like, what just happened? Where, where'd my malware go? And have no idea why I lost control of my debugger. So in typical academic fashion, I got more books. That'll solve the problem. Read more books. I ordered them, I read them, I Googled, I searched the ones that I had. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, practical malware analysis did come through for me a time or two. Those, uh, those chapters on anti-disassembly are gold. But, but mostly, I just flailed. Um, there, was, <laughs> there was no guidance, there was no direction. I was looking, I was way over my head. I flailed for a good two to three weeks, just stumbling my way through the code, figuring that if I hit it enough time, something would eventually fall out. Nice thing about a team mid-combustion, you can flail for two or three weeks, get absolutely nowhere, and no one notices. <laughs> I'm hesitant to say I got nowhere, though, you see. Um, as far as work products, I got nowhere. I had no indicators beyond those that fell out in the course of dynamic analysis. Um, I knew it was acting as admin, and I knew that I didn't give it explicitly give it admin. I was an administrative user, but I hadn't granted it admin privileges. Um, but I had no clue how it was doing that, and I had yet to explore the world of UAC bypass. I hadn't decoded the network communications or even really conclusively identified where they were occurring. Uh, my main work product from those two to three weeks was a very long list of questions. So at the end of that time, I looked at roughly 15 samples using dynamic, mostly dynamic analysis, let's be real here. Um, and I noticed some similarities and some differences. 
Uh, some of them appeared to be identical. Some of them were identical, but for different distractors that were dropped while it was doing the nasty things in the background. Um, but I was such an organizational disaster that had, you know, a team lead that I didn't have walked in and said, hey, what if these samples look identical? I'd have been like, oh. Um, so Friday the second week, Friday the second or third week, I decided it was time to sort out what I knew. I'd spent some chunk of time on this, and I knew something. Something had to have come out of that time. And so I listed the characteristics that I'd seen in the samples. So the distractors, the pr name of the process that launched, uh, the domains that it reached out to. And then I listed the samples that I'd looked at in a spreadsheet and set out to fill in all the little cells, right? Organize my knowledge. I organized my knowledge on those 15 samples and I left for the weekend. It was time to relax. And so before we leave those two weeks, I just want to highlight that frustrating though those were, right? It was not an enjoyable process. It was a lot of stress. I just moved from Florida to New Mexico and I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, but, but I did learn. I did make progress. It was slow and it was painful, but I made progress. And more relevant, I learned how to learn. So I finally found myself in a situation where not even Stack Overflow was going to help me. And I had somehow or another started blazing a way forward for myself. So now it was the weekend, and it was time to relax. And this is important. Because it's not while I'm sitting at my computer, staring at the screen, that I have good ideas. It's when I'm doing things that I enjoy. And so I went home, and I went hiking, and I baked, and I thought. And it dawned on me that I was behaving like an algorithm on Friday. I was looking at each sample, for each sample, checking for specific features that I had already noticed exist, and then documenting those features in a spreadsheet. Code can do that, right? So what if I could programmatically take these 68 samples and turn them into five or 10 groups of samples? And then I would only need to analyze five or 10 samples in depth and spot check the rest. So I went on on Monday all prepared to start coding. And coding, that was familiar. I knew how to do that, right? So doing this through dynamic analysis, I quickly realized was not feasible in a reasonable period of time, especially since the sample would not play well in a typical sandbox. And so most of my features that I had derived on, on Friday and cataloged, those were dynamic features. And so it was time to try to find static representations of those features. And so I started to code. Now, I'm going to tell you what I did. And it's painful to tell you, and it's embarrassing to tell you, because quite frankly, it, it wasn't pretty. But um, recounting, what I, recounting this given what I know now, eh. uh, but I went with the static characteristics of strings, strings, file name, file type, file size. So I had DLLs and DXEs, so file type was differentiating between those two. So it's like, I'm going to do this. Well, first thing I ran into, this magic Python library, there's three of them. So. I spent about an hour banging my head against the wall. I know how to code. Code's the one thing I know how to do. Why isn't it working, right? Why, why isn't magic working how the documentation says magic should work? Once I finally got past that, it only took me about an hour to code something useful up. Uh, and so what I built was a dictionary. Uh, so you would feed this script a directory of malware. And then from that, it would build a dictionary of all of the strings and all of the samples. And then the... Um, so the key would be the string, and then the value would be a list of the samples that that string had occurred in. And then I would throw away any of the strings that occurred in all of the samples, and I threw away any of the strings that only occurred in one samples, and then I spit the rest out for analyst analysis. This is not the height of sophistication, right? This is not a fancy machine learning solution, but for this set, it did what needed to be done, and it got me to where I needed to get. I ended up with eight sets of malware. And now that I had this more organized and significantly less overwhelming task, I was able to focus, and I was able to get into depth on individual samples. I found where the domains were being decoded. I could watch them in memory, be decoded one byte at a time. I, um, I found where the, the CNC was being encoded and sent over the network. I found what information was being pulled from the host to be sent over the network. I found this place where this random, seemingly random, file name was being written. The, the file name was generated in a very unique and not random way. I made real progress, finally. 
I was a malware analyst. Ultimately, I did write a report on this uh, family, but it, it was never published. Um, it was determined that it didn't offer anything new to what the community already knew about them. But nonetheless, this was an extremely valuable experience. So I mentioned that I was mentorless and team leadless, right? But I wasn't truly resourceless. Remember that guy that made the skunk threat? He lives in Nevada. I'm in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, so he was in on my interview, but I didn't meet him. He was just a voice on the other end of the speakerphone. I never met this guy, but I knew he existed. Um, and so now that I had done some actual work and I had gained some confidence, uh, I, I approached him with my report and I talked to him about the methodology that I used to divide these samples into families. He, in turn, did his first mentorly thing and introduced me to Yara rules. Way better than strings. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so he, and in turn me, uh, were not fans of, of strings-based Yara rules. They have a place, certainly, but they're typically over, overused. So he, um, he talked to me about code-based Yara rules and what makes a good code-based Yara rule. Uh, who here actually knows what Yara rules are? Okay, so, so for those of you who don't, uh, this is a pretty good description up here. The pattern matching Swiss knife for malware researchers. Think of them like regular expressions, but for byte patterns in code. Um, and so a good Yara rule, in my opinion, is code that a typical developer would copy and paste from one sample to another. Something that they've written, that they've written and it's unique, and that they don't want to have to write again because it, it performs some modular function. Um, so I read up on that. I read up on how to write YAR rules. I found an IDA plugin to help me generate YAR rules after I had identified code blocks. And then I went home. It was time for another weekend. Time for more baking, hiking, sewing, enjoying myself. So over the next week, and in the course of uh, several iterations of unplanned and disorganized scripting, followed by malware analysis. So I would script some, analyze, decide I wanted my script to do something else, tack some code on there, analyze some more malware. This resulted in some appallingly horrible Python. But it would take a directory of malware, and it would take a YAR rules file, and then it would spit out a CSV of each of the malware sample's basic static information, along with a Boolean variable indicating uh, what rules that sample of malware hit on. So this isn't sophisticated, right? This is just the same stuff that Yara Python would output to command line, but in a more organized form. So I'm not giving you all my hashes, sorry. Um, but you can see this is a somewhat redacted version of, um, of what it looks like in Excel. Um, so towards the, you know, I was working on this and I decided it would be really nice if this script would actually organize things for me. So that if I wanted to look at all the samples that hit on one YAR rule, I could go to a folder that had that YAR rule's name and then all the samples would be there. So I modified it a little bit so it would do that too. Natural extension of that, towards the end of the week, I decided it would be really nice if instead of just spitting all the information out for analyst analysis, it would form those groups for me. And so I decided I wanted something to cluster the malware based on its Yara hits, its file sizes, its file types, and a few other features. Clustering. Clustering. Machine learning clusters. I had done machine learning before. I should use machine learning. Right? No, not right. Uh, machine learning is, is, is powerful and it's great. Um, but I had human-derived intelligent features. And machine learning was grossly over-engineering this solution. All I really wanted was to sort. I wanted to see which samples hit on the same sets of Yara rules. That's sorting. That's not machine learning. Right? So after I had wasted a couple hours and realized that I was being dumb, I backed up and went with a much simpler solution. When I say much simpler, I'm saying programming one simple. I took all of those ones and zeros of the Yara rule hits and smushed them together into a string. That became my identifying string for that, for that pattern of yeah, my Yara hits. Then grouped all of the ones that had that same pattern and put them together in a group. Simple. So again, not the height of sophistication, but this tool has become integral to my analysis process. Um, and so this isn't a black box, 
right? This isn't some magical tool that you drop malware into and it spits out clusters for you. It just takes an analyst input. This takes an analyst hand selecting good YAR rules, which in order to find good YAR rules, you have to have something of a grasp on the code. Um, but from my perspective, that's, that's a strength. Um, so I can articulate to anybody interested and to my management, to stakeholders, anybody, exactly why I believe these samples belong to the same family, exactly why I believe these samples can be grouped together. It's because they were written with the same compiler, they have the same encoding mechanism for their command and control, because my YAR rules are telling me that. And so, again, not a black box, but once you've gotten your hands on a few samples and you've spent some time looking at them, um, and you want to know what the bigger picture looks like, it's a fantastic tool. And so this is what my analysis process looks like to this day. I analyze the malware, I write some rules, I run the script. I look at the results from that script. And so in this previous instance, right, you saw there were 20 samples there. I would probably say I don't believe that. I think those need, those need to be broken up further. And so I'm going to take that information and then go analyze the malware some more, look for some distinctions between that large group. Meanwhile, new malware is being fed in. Uh, we have some internal resources that I can use to find new malware based on uh, YARA rules. And so the better my YARA rules are, and by good, I mean uh, generalizable but not prone to false positives, the more malware samples I can get to spin into this process. And this process inherently helps me develop better malware samples, so it's good all around. Currently, there's, there's talk of integrating this with a malware repo uh, to create a uh, table of contents of sorts uh, for a malware repository so we know what we're holding and what YAR rules, everything that we're holding hit on. Uh, my mentor uses this to help him stay organized and to answer management questions about the development of malware families. And so this tool it has become a vital part of malware analysis, not only for me, but for my team. And I developed it as a result of flailing in the dark. So what's the point? Cool story, bro, but you going anywhere with this? I have a few, I promise. First and foremost, flailing's learning. And I want you new people to the field to know that. Um, if it feels like you're getting nowhere and all that you can do is just keep on looking at code that you don't necessarily have any clue what means, just do it. You'll get somewhere eventually. Computer security is a very hard field for new people to break into. Um, and, and don't let it run you off. So staying within the, the confines of knowledge, right? It was easy and it was comfortable and it was less stressful, but I was bored. I couldn't find anything that could hold my attention until I started venturing beyond where there's a path for me. And that's when I found malware analysis and that's when I finally stopped just, you know, being this unfocused blob of energy. Next point. If you find yourself acting like an algorithm, it's time to write an algorithm. I can't tell you how much I've seen people just, but this works and more code is just gonna complicate things, so let's do what works. Yes, that's true sometimes, but if you take the time to actually try to code it up, you might come up with something that works way better and that will work in the future and that others can use also. There's even that healthy chart to help you, a uh, helpful chart to help you determine at what point is it a good idea to, uh, to start writing code. Hopefully it doesn't turn into this. Um, that is a risk in any coding endeavor. Um, but here we are. The next point here, fresh eyes, value them. So it's really easy and common in this field to dismiss your new hires. They're fresh out of college. They can't possibly contribute anything useful. It's gonna be a year before they're even up to speed. And I'm not saying that happened to me. There was no one really there to dismiss me. Um, but it, it, it is common in this field. So value those new eyes, though, because new eyes on your, on your operations, on your uh, methodologies, can come up with new and unique solutions. And again, since I came in when my team was mid-combustion, I said that was partially a blessing. And one of the reasons for that is I've been able to assist and help in choosing and rebuilding this team. And so I've seen, even though I'm, I'm pretty darn new myself, I've seen plenty of new people come in and I've seen them challenge our workflows and develop tools that have made things more effective. And if we had said, no, you just graduated, do what you're told, we would never have those tools. So value your fresh eyes. 
Who here codes in their dreams? Anybody? Nobody here codes in their dreams? All right. There's a few. There's a few. Okay. So for me, breakthroughs and understanding, they don't happen when I'm actively looking for them. Uh, my mind needs to be free to churn without pressure or direction um, in order to have these creative ideas and these, these breakthroughs and understanding. And this isn't just me, right? Um, there, there's running jokes about having the best ideas in the shower or on the crapper, right? There's, there's even these like shower notepads for you so that you can record your best ideas that you have when you're in the shower. When you let your brain relax and when you give it no direction, it can do some pretty awesome things. And so for me, this happens mostly when I'm doing things that I enjoy, that are repetitive and don't take much brain power. Things like hiking, quilting, baking. And I have to protect those times because I always want to be doing 20 things at once. So I want to be quilting while watching Netflix. But that's not giving my, time, my brain time to turn on things. That's giving my brain time to focus on Netflix. So protect and value that time that you have for your brain to just churn and relax. So dreaming in code for me in school was a real problem. When I was stuck in a program, I would have so much trouble getting restful sleep because I would just be dreaming. Now I call them Ida nightmares, so I don't dream so much about code anymore <laughs> as being stuck in a loop in Ida. And I wake up saying F5, 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 or F9, or, or you know, for, for step over and continue respectively because I can't break out of this loop. Now I tend to view that as a, uh, a skew in work-life balance. But annoying though they are, these dreams occasionally result in new ideas. And if my brain is churning on things while I'm sleeping, I better believe that my brain is trying to solve problems while I'm awake. Next thing, you're not actually clueless. I wasn't clueless. I felt like I was clueless, but I wasn't. All of those books that I had read, the degrees that I had gotten, those were my foundation and those were my background. And ultimately, if I could fall back on those and trust them, that is how I got to where I got to. I wouldn't have had success with this malware sample, not even in a month, two months, a year, had I not had the foundation that I had, okay? So in this field, you're, there's always going to be something that you don't know, always. And at some point, you'll need to know it. Just because you don't know one thing doesn't mean you don't know anything. And so remind yourself of that periodically. So quick side story here, story within a story, recursion. Um, it's okay, there won't be a story within this one, we'll break out. Um, my mentor, uh, so, so obviously the one I came to New Mexico for, no. But there was the other one, the one that works remotely, and we've, we've made this work as a mentor relationship. Um, and so I have him on, on speakerphone uh, pretty often. And I was talking to him one day and we were looking at certs and I had never like, looked in depth to, to, into certificates. And he asked me a question, I was like, I don't know, I'm clueless. And he, he said, don't you ever say that about yourself again. And that kind of took me aback because my mentor, he's not one for compliments, okay? He's, he's a typical computer security kind of guy, taught himself. Um, and I, I'm not really one to crave external validation either, but it was kind of like, okay. But it was a well-timed reminder that, that I did have a foundation, that there was one thing I didn't know, but I was not clueless. So... In this field, there's always going to be things that you don't know. Just keep your perspective. And so one last note before I wrap up here. Um, the method of teaching sink or swim is pretty deeply ingrained in the computer security field. Would you all agree? OK. This, do not view this as a, as, as a presentation justifying using that to teach people. <laughs> uh, throwing your new hires into the deep end to see if they sink or swim is, is not in my opinion, the best way to teach somebody. Um, and it's very ingrained in this community, and I think it's an artifact of the fact that most of the old guard had to teach themselves. That was how they learned. That doesn't mean that that's the only way to learn. And so this was how I had to learn. I got thrown in, and I had to figure it out. And I know that because of how ingrained this is in the community, there's going to be other people who find themselves in my situation, and that's why I give this talk. That's why I am trying to encourage you to um, recognize it when you feel it and to learn to swim. But that doesn't mean that I consider it the best way to teach. Mentorship is so important. So I don't know if I'd have survived, survived at Los Alamos if I hadn't have found a mentor when I did. And he has 
helped me grow, helped me learn, helped me analyze. And I'm not saying he spoon feeds me. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone to say, hey, Lauren, strings are stupid. Go look at Yara. That's what I need. And that's what a mentor should do, point you in the right direction. And so for those of you out here who aren't early career, and that's a lot of you I can see, mentor your people. It doesn't need to be that much work. It just needs to be some attention to tell them that, hey, spending two weeks getting nowhere, it happens. It's OK. So thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. And I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor for questions. Go for it. So as you started out and as you started going through your journey learning, did you run across other people like you, uh, maybe in the chat room, the Slack, or whatever, that were having the same issues you were and kind of use that as a way to kind of have a crutch to, to lean on to learn other people? So I ran into it in my cohort. So with my friends. Uh, so did you run into other people who were having the same experience that you were having uh, in chat rooms or on Reddit or, or anywhere as you were going through your journey? Is that a good summary? Um, so I did with the cohort that I had graduated with from Florida State. Um, and so I kept in contact with some of those friends who were having similar issues. Um, I find that this, this tends to be a malware analysis, exploit development, the edge things that are really poorly documented. Um, and so, yeah, I did lean on people. Um, I also have seen this in people that have been hired after me. I've also found this in people uh, that came in after me. Um, and so I've been trying to, even though I'm not very senior myself, trying to mentor and, and give them a leg up to um, pay it forward. Yep. Okay. How's my experience been with CyberCore Scholarship for Service? Um, personally, I am I'm thrilled with it. Um, I graduated with no debt and money in the bank and a job and a location that I love doing something that I love. Um, I'm not going to say I'm going to stay in government for my entire career. Um, I think you got to move around a little and experience different things. Um, but I've loved Los Alamos, and I, I've, I have no complaints about the program itself. We've recruited from it, too, with success. So for malware analysis, <laughs> come on. There they are. I have all of these books. I've read all of these books. I wasn't lying when I said that you know, I bought them and I read them when I was flailing. Um, I really love practical malware analysis to anyone that's just getting into the field. Um, don't neglect the labs. The labs are the best part of the book. Uh, and you can modify a Windows uh, 7 box to work in the way that XP does, and the labs will continue to work. If you try to redo the labs in Windows 7 raw, they will not. Um, the Malware Analyst Cookbook and DVD has a really good um, chapter on setting up a safe sandbox environment. Uh, that's something that I think practical malware analysis kind of skimps on. Um, they tell you what a safe environment is, but not so much how to build it. Um, and that's something you definitely need before you start doing malware analysis. Um, and then the other two books are a little more advanced, um, but equally useful. Uh, they're not focused on malware analysis. Neither of those books are. Uh, but they're useful um, nonetheless. Right. So the question was, have you used this experience to uh, build any learning programs for others so that you can help them not drown like I had to? And yes, and not just within Los Alamos. Um, I've been back to my university to give talks um, on malware analysis and on this sensation, this feeling of drowning, because I think one of the important things is to recognize it and to have somebody tell you that, that you'll, you'll swim. It'll, it'll happen. It's uncomfortable while you're working on it, but you'll get there. 
Um, I've also, I don't think that you can teach your way out of this, this drop-off, but I do think that um, more documentation, more um, experience being out in the open instead of, uh, you know, in the basement BNSA, like sharing the knowledge uh, will help with this problem also. Yep, go for it. So did I find this hard, this feeling of flailing hard to communicate to my leadership? Uh, and did that, that make it difficult to spin up a way to catch others? Um, I don't, I think they can relate. Um, and I think that they can understand. I also um, didn't find myself needing to explain it much. Um, and so this honestly has been the most explaining of it that I have done. Um, and so, they're, I've helped mentor new hires, and they're open to that because someone's got to do it. And so they're not going to tell me, um, no, they don't need it. They're open to that. Uh, I, have, I have a good, good management in place now. Um, and so, I, no, I haven't had any pushback, but explaining like malware concepts to them, like I might spend two weeks looking at a sample and still get nowhere. I mean, that's, that's not a thing of the past. <laughs> Um, and explaining that concept to management can, can be difficult sometimes. Um, but I think that's the field of computer security. I think that's the field of a lot of things. I think we've all had that conversation with our team leads once or twice. Anything else? So a question that my uh, team lead asked when I presented this to him was, was how can this help management? Like, what can management do? And my answer to that was mentor. Um, put mentors in place. And this isn't just a formal, this person, that's your mentor. And I put that on paper, and thus it is. Mentoring needs to be more of a natural to people connect. You need people willing to mentor for that relationship to build. I saw a hand over here. Yep. Okay, so you mentioned introductory courses that you took. Uh, if you could go through and make a wish list for those courses, uh, what would it be? Um, so my reverse engineering course, um, I wish that we had learned to build a safe environment for analyzing malware samples, because there are other applications of reverse engineering, certainly, um, but malware is a big one right now. Um, and so I got through my entire reverse engineering course without having built a sandbox because we were reverse engineering safe binaries. Um, and so that's one thing I really wish I had learned. Um, for offensive security, uh, it was really low level focused. Um, so building exploits for, from scratch, breaking into vanilla Linux systems. Um, and I wish I had learned how to use some of the tools that are out there more um, because, because frankly, uh, I'm sure it happens, but, but building an exploit from scratch to break into a vanilla system is not what we're doing in the field. Um, so more experience with the tools that are actually being used in the field as opposed to the academic side of this is how it happened 20 years ago. Anyone else? Yep, go for it. Notice I didn't bring it up. <laughs> I suspect coming in as a female made me feel more intimidated. I am the only female on my team. Um, and so I, I have found being a female to undermine me more than anything. And by undermine, I mean you got this job because you're a woman, not because you're qualified, okay? Don't do that. <laughs> um, so I don't think it was necessarily made it harder for me to find a mentor, um, but I think it, it was a confidence issue in me approaching somebody. I think if there were another woman on the team, I would have been more likely to approach her sooner um, than the, the mentor that I did approach. Um, yeah. 
Does that answer that a little bit? All right. Going once, twice. All right, I'll be around after the talk. Good.